Today on America's Test Kitchen, Julia shows Bridget the secrets to home corned beef with vegetables. Jack challenges Bridget to a tasting of sherry vinegar. And Elle cooks up the ultimate snickerdoodle cookies right here on America's Test Kitchen. Today is all about corned beef, or should I say beef that has been corned. Corning is a means of curing meat for preservation using lots of salt, and that dates back to prehistoric times. Now the process actually gets its name from the large kernels of salt, or corns, that were used. Those big pieces of salt were packed into barrels with the meat so that it could last for long periods of time. Now you scraped your last meal from the bottom <laughs> of the barrel, and that's where the phrase came from. Here's how the salt works. It kills the pathogens, it speeds up the drying process by pulling the water out of the meat through osmosis, and it adds flavor. Corning your beef takes some planning ahead, but the results are so worth it. Mm -hmm. Today we're going to show you how to harness the power of salt to make your own homemade corned beef. Unlike supermarket corned beef, home corned beef is not a salt lick. Mm -hmm. When done well, it has a seasoned but balanced and complex flavor, which starts with the corning process itself. Now there's two methods. There's the dry method and the wet method. So the dry method has salt and seasonings. You rub it on the meat, you put it in plastic, and you put it in the fridge, and then you go in there every day, and you flip it, and you flip it, and you flip it. I've done that. Mm -hmm, and it's good. The wet method, however, is a lot easier. You add all the seasonings and salt to water, you soak the meat in that brine, and you just let it sit there. You don't have to mess with it at all. Now, of course, we did a side-by-side -side test to see which one tasted better, and it was a tie. They both tasted great. So we're going to go for the easy method here, wet corning. All right. And here I have four quarts of water. To this, I'm going to add a good amount of salt. Now, this is three quarters of a cup of table salt. We're also going to add a little sugar. This is half a cup of brown sugar. We're also going to add a little bit of pink salt. This is two teaspoons of pink preserving salt. And this pink salt was a little controversial in all of our edit meetings because you're adding nitrites to the water. But it does a few things. One, it helps the meat stay a little bit more pink. But two, and more importantly to us, the meat tasted better. In fact, we did blind tastings of meat corned with and without the pink salt. And they all unanimously picked the one that was brined with pink salt. So just two teaspoons does the trick. All right. Just a tiny bit of pink salt. Now, pink salt is a blend of sodium chloride, or table salt, and sodium nitrite. The specialty product, sodium nitrite, is dyed pink to distinguish it from table salt. Only a small amount of it is needed for curing and achieving the trademark pink color of corned beef. When the nitrite breaks down into nitric oxide, it binds with the iron atom in myoglobin, and that is the protein that makes meat red, locking in the pink color. All right, so, so a few more flavorings for our brine here. We're gonna add four bay leaves, some garlic. This is three cloves of peeled garlic, some black pepper. This is a tablespoon of black peppercorns, a tablespoon of coriander, and five allspice berries. Now I'm just gonna whisk this up, make sure the salt and that sugar is well dissolved before we add the meat. All right, so our brine is ready. Time to talk about beef. So we're obviously using beef brisket because that's the traditional cut for corned beef. And there's two kinds of beef brisket. There's the point cut and the flat cut. So if you want to pretend we are looking inside of a cow, this is exactly how these pieces of meat would lay. So this is the point cut, and it lays sort of on top of the flat cut. And when you separate them, you can see there's quite a difference here. You can see this flat cut is nice and even and has a great shape, whereas this point cut hmm, is a little loppy. So we prefer the flat cut. Perfect. And you can find this a lot easier at most supermarkets. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes these cuts come with a really thick fat cap that you'd want to trim off, but this looks pretty good. It's really no thicker than a quarter inch in any one place, so it's ready to go in the brine. Oh, no prep, just right in. Right in. Now, to help keep this piece of meat submerged, I'm just going to put a plate on top. There you go. Now, we're going to cover this. And it goes into the refrigerator for at least six days, but you could do it up to eight days. And again, you don't have to do anything here. You just have to let it sit. No flipping. No flipping. No turning. No turning. Just waiting. Mm, that's it. All right, so this beef has been corned for six days, and I've taken it out of the brine and patted it dry. But here I want to show you what happens if you don't wait the six days. Here's a piece of beef that's only been corned for three days, and you can see that strip in the middle that is gray compared to the pink around it, and that pink salt has worked its way in only so far, but that very center, not yet corned. So that's why it's really important to wait the entire six days. 
All right, so now it's time to cook the beef. And really, most recipes just put the corned beef right in water and boiled it that way. But we're going to add just a few flavorings to that water to really pump up the flavor. So here, I'm going to take two bay leaves, three cloves of garlic, and one tablespoon of black peppercorns. I'm just going to put them in this square of cheesecloth. I'm just going to use a piece of kitchen twine and just wrap it around really well. Tie it up. And there we go, a little sachet for our corned beef. I thought you were going to put that under my pillow. <laughs> <laughs> it does look sweet, doesn't it? All right, so I'm going to put this sachet in this nice big Dutch oven that's filled with two quarts of water. And now we're going to add our corned beef. And I know what you're thinking, that's not going to fit in that pot. Mm -hmm. But don't you worry. This corned beef will really shrink as it cooks so that by the end, it'll fit in the pot perfectly. OK. All right, so we're going to bring this up to a simmer. Then we're going to put the lid on it and cook it in the oven, so a low oven, 275 degrees. And again, much like the corning, it wasn't a lot of work, but you had to wait for it. <laughs> it's going to spend two and a half to three hours in the oven till that corned beef is super tender. All right, so this guy's been in the oven for about three hours. Ah, oh, Roma's wafting out at oh, me. Oh, it is, isn't it? All right, and the way to tell if it's done cooking or not is you want to hold it up. You want to take a dinner fork, and you just want to stab it in. And that dinner fork, you can see it just comes right off. Oh, you can see it's starting to come apart. That's a good sign that it's fork tender. So this guy is ready to come out. Here, I'm going to lift him out in one piece, put him onto a platter. Of course, he's going to rest for a little bit while we finish cooking the vegetables. But I'm going to keep him nice and moist. So I'm going to take about a cup of this broth. I'm going to pour it over the top. Ooh. Yeah so that as he rests, he won't dry out. Of course, I'm going to cover it with foil to help keep it warm. So if you wouldn't mind turning the oven off, we're going to keep this guy warm in the oven as we finish cooking the vegetables. All right, with that beef staying nice and warm in the oven, it's time to turn our attention to the vegetables. And now these are the classic vegetables that you serve with corned beef. We have potatoes, carrots, and cabbage. The thing is, the cabbage cooks much more quickly than the carrots or the potatoes. So we're going to add these to the pot first before adding the cabbage six carrots, and one and a half pounds of little red potatoes. So we're going to bring this up to a simmer, then turn the heat down to medium low, put the cover on, and let it cook for about seven minutes. All right, so it's been about seven minutes. Ooh, smelling good. Now it's time to add the cabbage. And this is one head of cabbage, but we cut it into eight pieces. But each piece has a little bit of that core that's going to help the cabbage hold together as it cooks. This is another thing. A lot of people add the cabbage at the very start of the recipe with the beef. <laughs> Ooh, you got some stinky corned beef in that mm -hmm. case. All right, so I have this cranked over high heat to get that liquid to come back to a quick simmer. Looks like it's there. So I'm going to put the lid on. I'm going to turn the heat down to medium low. I'm going to let this cook for about 15 minutes longer until all the vegetables are tender. All right, so these vegetables have been cooking for about 15 minutes. So let's go in and see if they're tender. Oh, that cabbage looks pretty perfect. It stayed together, too. Mm-hmm. It's falling apart on the edges, but it has a little bit of texture in the middle. That's just how I like it. All right, so I'm going to turn this heat off with the lid on. I'm going to keep these warm while we slice into that corned beef. And here we go. Of course, I'm cutting it across the grain, although this corned beef is going to be so tender, it's not going to even really <laughs> matter. Look at that. Rosy, rosy. Oh. So good. And you're slicing it paper thin, which is really, really nice mm. with something like corned beef. Yeah. Mm. So we're just going to put these vegetables on the side of the platter. Now I'm just going to put the meat on the platter. While you do that, I've got a surprise for you. I'll meet you at the other All end. All right. No, now I'm curious what you got in store. All right. Oh, here we go. I think this is enough for two of us. <laughs> Holy moly. <laughs> it is centerpiece. Is that what I think it is? It is. So oh. you made the food. Yes. I made the beer for I you. I know this beer. This is your favorite beer, a cream ale, since oh. you're from upstate New York. That's it. Knew you'd love it. I've oh. chosen an Irish red. Mmm, perfect. All right. Let me serve you up some of this wonderful corned beef here. Potato and a carrot and, of course, a wedge of cabbage. I've got a little bit of... Oh, I love having whole grain mustard with my corned beef. This meat is so tender, you don't even need a knife. It just flakes right apart. <laughs> it does. Absolutely incredibly tender. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you just can't buy corned beef this good. No, especially since the corned beef that you buy at the supermarket, most of it tastes like you opened up the salt shaker mm -hmm. and poured it in your mouth. Mm -hmm. And you know, 
Brisket is a hard cut of beef to get really nice and tender, mm -hmm. but you did it. With that cooking method, nice and low. This is outstanding, mm -hmm. and we've got the whole night to finish this off. Yeah. <laughs> Making home corned beef that's balanced in flavor and incredibly tender is a relatively hands-off procedure. Soak a flat-cut brisket for six days in a brine made with both table and pink curing salt, as well as sugar, whole spices, and garlic. Then to tenderize tough brisket, gently simmer the meat in a low oven. Now while the meat rests, simmer carrots, potatoes, and cabbage in that seasoned cooking liquid. Serve with whole grain mustard and maybe even a glass of beer that your friend brewed for you. And there you have it, from our test kitchen to your kitchen, the easiest yet best tasting home corned beef with vegetables that you'll ever have. Mm -hmm. Cheers. Cheers to that. White wine, red wine, cider, and balsamic vinegars already take up my valuable cabinet space, but I'm here with Jack to find out if I should make a little bit more space for sherry vinegar. I'm going to tell you that you need to get rid of all those vinegars and make room for the sherry vinegar. Really? This is actually my favorite vinegar, the one that I use every night when I make salad. All right, well, I'm definitely <laughs> intrigued. What makes this so great is it starts with fine wine. Sherry is white wine that's aged in oak barrels, fortified with brandy, and then you turn it into vinegar and age it even longer in wood barrels. So you get wood, smoke, leather, berries, mm -hmm. all from this delicious vinegar. So start sipping. While you're sipping, I'm gonna tell you that what is complicated about cherry vinegar is figuring out which brand to buy. Because I think most people would walk into the store and see this pretty little bottle in front of me, comes from Spain, most expensive choice, that is 50 years old. If you look at this, it says 50 Reserva, which makes you think it is 50 years old, and say, oh, it must be the best. Now, right. while this is actually a fine vinegar, it's not really 50 years old. It is what they call fractional average, which means some of the vinegar in this bottle is 50 years old. The rest of it, not clear how old that vinegar is. Interesting, so it's kind of like how I tell my age. I am so totally not gonna go there. <laughs> so what we found that was really important was not so much age. We love some old ones, we love some younger ones, was a little bit of sweetness. There are two favorites. One, we think the wine is naturally sweet. There was no added sugar on the label. It just tasted sweeter. A runner-up, they add apricot wine. Now, apricot wine is obviously fairly sweet, mm -hmm. and so they are getting a little bit of sweetness in there, and it balances out the acidity. This is a high acid vinegar. These are all about 7%, okay. as opposed to some rice vinegars might be 4%, white wine might be 5 or 6%. These are really pretty acidic vinegars to match all of those big flavors. Mm -hmm. So, I've been telling you a lot about my favorite vinegar. <laughs> yes, you're, you're very puckery now, aren't you? <laughs> Zing! <laughs> Obviously, we haven't really talked about the fact the colors are different, aren't they? A huge difference in color, lighter to darker here. You know, if I was to go into some place and they would say, try these vinegars, I would assume that this one is the best because it's darker. It just seems like it would have been aged a lot more. I tell you one thing, though, in terms of flavor, I'm just gonna scoot this one right out. I could probably dip my fingernail in there and it would remove any kind of polish I may have on my hand. It is really harsh. Just, I, I could almost not even taste it. Of course, you wouldn't be sipping sherry vinegar out of shot glasses at home. Uh, only here in the test kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> During the process of making vinegar, so in the old-fashioned world, they would take the bacteria from an old batch of vinegar to make a new batch of vinegar. Of course, nobody does that. Mm -hmm. Even the expensive vinegars don't do that. They make it in something called an acetator. And during that processing, they can develop these compounds that remind you of acetone, which is, of course, the thing that does remove nail polish. And every time we've done a vinegar tasting, whether it's red wine, white wine, cherry, we have occasionally found some vinegars that have those notes. And that's a clear defect. All the experts agree that that's not what good vinegar tastes like. So there's one that you don't like. There's three that you're still sampling. Yeah, this one is really light. If I had to choose one that possibly had any kind of apricot in it, it would be this one. I could definitely drizzle this over some fruit and be very, very happy with that. Okay. And these two are very close. I think I like this one a little bit better. It is a little bit sweeter to me. This one has a stronger brandy flavor to me. I okay. can definitely pick up on the brandy, which I love, but if I'm tasting sherry vinegar, I want that to go a little bit more into the background. Okay. And so I would say these two are my favorites. I'm gonna go with this one, though. You're gonna go with that one? Yes. Okay, uh -oh. uh, uh, all right. <laughs> you wanna see what you chose? Sure. 
So, Palip, totally on. You chose a runner-up. This is actually from California. Oh, sherry vinegar, it's the one that has a little bit of apricot wine. Should I go with this one? Sure. All right. You're in agreement with the panel. This is their least favorite, Pompeian. It has those acetone notes that are really just unpleasant and very quickly got dismissed from consideration, Good. just like you did. All right. And this one? This is our winner. So we felt like this one, which despite the name, Napa Valley, it's actually from Spain. This has residual sweetness. We assume that it's coming from the grapes themselves. Okay. And that they're just using slightly sweeter grapes than other brands. Makes sense. And then this one? Well, and this one you liked because mm -hmm. it's the most expensive. <laughs> yeah, so it's my diamond taste. <laughs> yeah, so this was our third place. We loved it. It's delicious, but we're not sure it's worth twice the price given the fact that it's really not any better than the runner-up or the winner. Well, you saw the winner, and that is Napa Valley Naturals by way of Spain, Reserve Sherry Vinegar, and that is $5.49 per bottle. Today we're going to make a well-known New England cookie called a snickerdoodle, which has a unique flavor all its own. Each cookie is rolled in cinnamon sugar before baking, but this sweetness is balanced by a distinctive mild tang. And its texture is interesting, with a very chewy center and a flat, crinkly top. And today, Elle is going to take us to Snickerdoodle School. Hey, Julia. Hey, Elle. Did you know that Snickerdoodles was the first thing I ever made back in Detroit? It was? In my home economics class. How old yeah, are you? Probably 12. Aww. I know. I knew then I was going to make Snickerdoodles for the rest of my life. That's a good cookie. Absolutely. Okay, so we have here two and a half cups of flour, two teaspoons cream of tartar, one teaspoon of baking soda, and half teaspoon of salt. So we tested this recipe with baking powder versus baking soda, and we found that baking powder makes the cookie rise too quickly in the oven. The combination of baking soda and cream of tartar actually was perfect. It goes in the oven, it rises and falls quickly, gives us that distinct crinkly snickerdoodle mm -hmm. top we're looking for. And that's our dry ingredients. We're ready to start the wet. We have here eight tablespoons of vegetable shortening, and we also have eight tablespoons of butter. Mm -hmm. Unlike butter, vegetable shortening doesn't have any water, so it allows our cookies to have a nice shape, they don't spread too much, and they get that nice crispy edge around it. In this case, we're gonna use butter and vegetable shortening. Because that butter has more flavor than vegetable shortening, which pretty much has no flavor at all. So this process we're doing here is called creaming. We're creaming the butter and the one and a half cups of sugar. And we're gonna do that for three minutes at medium speed. And this is a classic way to start any cookie by creaming the butter and sugar together before adding the liquid ingredients in the flour. And the way that you know you're ready to move on to the next step is when your batter's looking light and fluffy. Mm -hmm. The color's a little lighter. It almost looks like icing. So we're gonna go with our next step, which is adding two eggs. One egg at a time. Because you're incorporating liquid into a thick batter, and by doing it slowly, you'll avoid lumps. So I'm not gonna add the second of our two eggs. That second egg is incorporating very well. Looks good. So I'm not gonna add our flour, mixing our dry into our wet, and we're just gonna do so in small doses. Because if you add it all at once, boom. That's right. You're gonna be in a flour cloud. That's looking great. This is getting me so excited for <laughs> Snickerdoodles. I'm reliving it all over again. <laughs> I think we're all set to mm. go. Okay, so I'm just gonna give this one last stir to make sure we have everything in the bottom of the mixer incorporated. I can't tell you how many times I found half of my ingredients in the bottom of the bowl. So I'm gonna roll these snickerdoodles out. Mm -hmm. While I do that, will you mix my cinnamon and sugar? Ooh, the best part. The best part. You're the most important mm -hmm. part of this machine mm -hmm. today. This is a quarter cup of sugar and a tablespoon of cinnamon. Mm, that's gonna taste good on the outside of those cookies. Oh yeah, that intense amount of cinnamon is gonna give you a nice crust on the top. Now, if I got you right, you're just portioning the dough out at this point. We're not baking them on this tray. No, not at all. We're just making sure that each cookie is two tablespoons and that they're ready for rolling. All right. All Are right. you ready to rock? I'm ready to roll. Let's roll it then. <laughs> In cinnamon sugar. Of course. This cinnamon sugar is gonna give our cookie that nice, crispy, tasty exterior. Mm. That's a snickerdoodle. That is a snickerdoodle. All right, now. How do I put them on the baking sheet? Just make sure you put them at least two inches apart on the cookie sheet. All right. We're gonna do three across, two in the middle, and three across. That's a plan. And you can keep on rolling. <laughs> I'm gonna go to the oven. 
These are gonna go in the oven in the middle rack at 375 degrees for 10 minutes, rotating at about five minutes. Ooh, you said ah. it. There's that cinnamon waff. Oh yeah. Those are gorgeous. Aren't they pretty? Now how do you know they're done? Well, the edges have started to set mm -hmm. and they're still puffy in the top. All right, we're gonna let those rest for 10 minutes to finish doing their thing. <laughs> So let's move on and put our next tray in the oven. All right, Julia, we got a lot going on here. Mm -hmm. We have a cooled batch of cookies. Hello. We have a cooling batch of cookies, <laughs> and we have a cooking batch of cookies. I'm gonna, in the meantime, transfer our cooling batch. Oh, those look good. <laughs> they look so good. So you're transferring them from the warm baking sheet to the wire rack so they can finish cooling completely? Yes, and with the baking sheet on the rack, they're gonna cool evenly from the bottom to the top. All right, I believe our third batch mm. is a charm. Well, this is pretty interesting because you kind of see the progression of the cookies as they fall and cool. So this is a cooled cookie, and this is one right out of the oven. And you can see it has that domed top, and obviously that's gonna fall as the cookie cools. All right, so you're not gonna make me wait until all these cookies are cooled before we dig in, are you? Uh, yeah, we have to wait for every <laughs> single one. I'm it's kidding. It's not gonna happen. I'm kidding. Oh, good. We can eat cookies now. Mm. Which one do you want? I'm going for this guy. I like mine a little more brown. I'm gonna go with this guy. Oh, look at that. You can see that bend. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's that chewy center. Winning. Mmm. Mmm. Awesome job. Thank you, madam. <laughs> you snickerdoodled it. <laughs> I love these cookies. <laughs> Thank you. To make this traditional New England cookie, use a combination of butter and shortening for chewy centers with super crisp edges. For that hallmark crinkly looking top and distinctive tangy flavor, use extra baking soda along with some cream of tartar. Finally, roll the cookies thoroughly in cinnamon sugar before baking them one tray at a time. From America's Test Kitchen to your kitchen, a traditional recipe for New England style snickerdoodles. You can get this recipe, all the recipes from this season, along with our tastings, testings, and selected episodes on our website, americastestkitchen.com. Thanks for watching America's Test Kitchen. What'd you think? Well, leave a comment and let us know which recipes you're excited to make, or you can just say hello. You can find links to today's recipes and reviews in the video description. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you later. I'll see you later.